Good morning. Welcome to the King Institute for Faith and Culture. This morning we go back again to an old tradition at King that goes back to around 1960, the tradition of having uh, two students and two faculty elected every year to do a lecture on something of interest to them. Our faculty lecture this morning is from Dr. Kyle Osborne, but I'm going to leave it to Emily to introduce him. Let me let you know briefly that we do have more events coming up for those of you in need of CCS credit uh, and also enrichment. Uh, next Monday we have artist Bruce Herman. Bruce is a very fine artist, he's an old friend, and he'll be here on March 25th. On April 1st we have tenor uh, Aaron Blake. Aaron will speak in the morning and he's going to perform in the evening. He worries, um, usually sings for the Metropolitan Opera in New York. And then finally on April 8th, President Whitaker will give us his valedictory address as he uh, prepares to retire. So we do have some more events coming up, but for the moment I'm going to hand it over to Emily Cosco. Good morning. My name is Emily Casca, and I've been given the great privilege of introducing Dr. Osborne this morning. Dr. Osborne arrived at King around a decade ago in 2014, and he was recently promoted to Associate Professor of History. Dr. Osborne graduated from ETSU and completed his PhD at the University of Georgia, researching the emotional experience of American Civil War. In the History Department here at King, Dr. Osborne specializes in American history, you can ask anyone that's taken any of his classes and they'll agree, Dr. Osborne makes history interesting and engaging. Not only does he set the rich historical content, context for the content that he presents, but he really encourages his students to dig into the why of major historical events. One thing that I've learned about the many classes that I've taken with Dr. Osborne is that he has this thing about threes. He usually has three big points or three reaction papers or three big exams. So um, I've decided to list three things about Dr. Osborne. First is that Dr. Osborne is the most helpful professor that I've ever had in my academic career. Whether it's been recording a lecture so that I could stay on track while my mom was in the hospital or building a course covering the Civil War to help me and other students meet a course requirement or helping me resolve a scheduling issue, Dr. Osborne has been a huge support during my time at King. Second, no matter how well you think that you can hide it, Dr. Osborne always knows when you didn't do the reading, especially, <laughs> especially when you choose Richard Nixon as the answer on an ancient Rome exam. And finally is this. I would not be standing here today in my senior year at King University getting ready to student teach and become a history teacher if it weren't for the many wonderful professors and teachers here at King like Dr. Osborne. My first acquaintance with King was as a dual enrollment student in Dr. Osborne's U.S. survey course. This course gave me a confidence to enroll at King, and the many other history courses that I've taken here have further inspired my love of history and my passion to teach the next generation. Thank you, Dr. Osborne, for all that you do. And with that, would you all join me in welcoming Dr. Osborne? Thank you, Emily. Uh, I offered my, my daughters the opportunity to miss half the school today and come to the King Talk. They asked me who was speaking. I said it was me, and they said they'd pass. Um, as my youngest daughter said, Dad, I, I hear you almost every day. It's, uh, it's not a big thing. All right, in 1858, in the state of Illinois, there was a Senate contest. It pitted Stephen Douglas, the incumbent and a Democrat, against the challenger Abraham Lincoln, a Republican, the Republican Party had just popped up in the northern states as an anti-slavery party. Douglas was a man of national reputation. Lincoln was not well known out of the state of, outside of the state of Illinois. And the two figures decided to conduct a series of debates, seven debates. And unless you're from Illinois or you've had some kind of automobile malfunction while driving to St. Louis, you've probably heard of none of these towns. It's Ottawa, Freeport, uh, Jonesboro, Charleston, Galesburg, Quincy, and Alton each in a separate congressional district in Illinois. They did not speak in Chicago, Peoria, or Springfield, at least not on the same stage. As would be expected uh, in the political culture of the time, uh, this is before we have Taylor Swift concerts and NASCAR races, uh, political debates were entertainment. People came to see them for fun. And so the debates drew tremendous local interest. Uh, in the, uh, the city of Ottawa, 
uh, the estimate was 10,000 people attended the debate. The population of Ottawa at the time was only 9,000. What was less expected was that the debates made national news. They were picked up by the New York newspapers in particular, the New York Tribune and the New York Times. The New York Times decided that the Illinois race was the most exciting race of the 1858 elections. And then of course in memory, Lincoln went on not just to become president, but perhaps the most renowned and revered president in American history. When commentators and scholars have talked about the debates, they've tended to idealize the debates. They've decided it's the greatest political debates in American history. And often when scholars make this attribution or when they say this, these great things about the debates, they're usually implicitly or explicitly making a criticism of the, uh, the politics of their own time. We were great back then, we're not so great now. Uh, they would point to the literary quality of the speeches, their long lyrical sentences, their allusions to classical sources. It showed a more engaged populace and a more informed electorate. At least that's what people say. One such critic uh, from the 1980s and 1990s was named Neil Postman. He said about the debates, they were the preeminent example of political discourse in the mid 19th century, a kind of oratory that may be described as literary. So, so good they're not just political talks, they're actually art. He then compared that quite dismissively to the politics of his own time, the 1980s and 1990s, which he dismissed as showbiz politics. It's gonna be the contention of my little talk today that many of the unlikable, unfavorable elements of today's politics were very much evident in 1858 and in those debates. So I'm not sure if this should make us feel good or make us feel bad, but we've kind of always been this way. The stuff that we don't like now, we can find evident again in 1858. Political scientists have asked people in recent years what they don't like about modern politicians. There's been tons of surveys and work on this issue. And the things that they come up with repeatedly are the things that many people talk about when they talk about the unpleasantness of 2024. They talk about the extreme partisanship, almost the blind partisanship of politicians today. They talk about the lack of civility or respect politicians show each other. They talk about the tendency of politicians to provide disinformation, even conspiracy theory. And they talk about how politicians, to quote one survey, stoke demagogic fears of outsiders and others, which from what I can tell is just a sort of polite way of saying racism. Again, all of these features will be evident in the 1858 debates and all of these features and characteristics with perhaps the exception of the last one were evident by Abraham Lincoln himself, particularly the conspiratorial thinking, as we'll see. Um, this is not gonna be a weird talk where I bash or do some kind of strange diatribe against Abraham Lincoln. As my students will attest, I very much admire Lincoln, not as much as I admire President Richard Nixon but it's a close second. And I should say in Lincoln's personal life and in his professional life as a lawyer, he had a reputation for meticulous honesty. He even sometimes, uh, if he felt that a client of his had, been over, uh, had overpaid, he would send some of the money back, which I think is against the law today. And as a politician, he did have some cardinal vir virtues from which he never deviated. He believed that the United States was a Republican experiment, that what made the United States special at the time was that it was the only free government in the world. He saw it as the great hope for the future. And he also believed that all human beings, because they were human, deserved to have natural rights. And for Lincoln, those natural rights, what we might call human rights today, were enshrined in the Declaration of Independence as life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And again, Lincoln believed that all people, at all times, in all places, deserve these rights. That made Lincoln, from the very beginning of his political career, a consistent critic of slavery. He said consistently, repeatedly, that slavery was a moral evil. He was not an abolitionist, but again, throughout his entire time, his entire life, he spoke of slavery as an evil. That being said, Abraham Lincoln was very much a creature of partisan politics, of the politics of the 1850s, and he would probably have to get a haircut, he would probably have to dress a little differently. I think he could actually operate quite fine uh, in the politics of today. 
All right, before going into the debates, um, I do need to provide a little bit of historical context. I will try to use all my Osborne magic to, to make this as succinct as possible. Uh, two policy positions to talk about and two events to talk about. Uh, but first off, the United States in 1850 had 30 states. In 15 of those states, the free states, the northern states, the states in dark green, slavery had been banned. In the southern states, slavery was still legal. The big question for politicians in the 1850s, the big, in the 1850s, the big debate that divided North and South and eventually pushed the country towards civil war was the question of slavery's legality in the Western territories. Would slavery be allowed in places like Kansas, Utah, and California? It was the belief of many politicians at the time that if slavery did spread West, if it was established in those Western territories, it would remain in the United States forever it would become, in essence, a perpetual institution. It was the hope of some, like Abraham Lincoln, if slavery was stopped, if it was prevented from being established in the West, it would put the country on the path toward emancipation. They may have been wrong, they may have been right about this, but that was the belief of many politicians at the time. Just looking at Northern politicians, Northern politicians basically landed on two political positions, policy positions, in regards to this question, the legality of slavery in the West. The first position was called free soil. It was the position of Abraham Lincoln. It was the position of the newly formed Republican Party, which again was a party that just existed in the Northern states, the free states uh, during this time. The Republicans like Lincoln often spoke of slavery as a moral evil. The last thing we would ever wanna do is add more evil. The other position, the position of most de Northern Democrats especially Stephen Douglas. Stephen Douglas was the, the big champion of this policy position, was called popular sovereignty. This is where the settlers themselves would vote on whether or not their territory would have slavery. So will there be slavery in Kansas? The voters of Kansas themselves would decide in an election. The Northern Democrats held this position in part because they had to appease their Southern wing, the pro-slavery wing, uh, the North Republicans didn't have to worry about this. They did not have a Southern wing at the time. They also held this position because they did not see slavery as a moral evil. They often talked about it as uh, in terms of moral neutrality. They felt about slavery the way I feel about Taylor Swift. Uh, it's not for me, but I don't think we should ban it. All right, and third, and maybe most important for our talk today, most Northern Democrats tended to believe that slavery simply would not develop in the West because of climate, because of the geography, that you would not have plantations in Kansas or Nebraska or Utah or Colorado. The weather, the climate, the geography would just not allow it. All right, popular sovereignty, that was the position of most Northern, Northern Democrats. It was the position of the two Democratic presidents of the 1850s as well. That would be Franklin Pierce, our 14th president, and James Buchanan, our 15th president. Students are always after me, demanding more Franklin Pierce content. So <laughs> you get a little of that uh, today. Anyway, those names will be significant down the road. All right, and then the two events. In 1854, Douglas was charged by the Senate with the task of organizing the territory to the west of Iowa and Missouri. Settlers were starting to show up there in heavy number but the territory had not been organized. There was not a territorial government created as of yet. It was Douglas's task to try to organize these lands. The fruit of his work uh, was the notorious Kansas-Nebraska Act passed by Congress in 1854. It created two new territories, the territories of Kansas and Nebraska, with the provision that slavery's legal status would be decided by popular sovereignty, the settlers themselves, would vote on whether their territory would have slavery. It was a controversial act. It was panned by critics like Abraham Lincoln as a pro-slavery move. Douglas did not see it that way. Again, he assumed that slavery simply would not develop in a place like Kansas, in a place like Nebraska. Our second event involves the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. His name was Roger Taney. In my first class I ever taught, when I showed this picture of Roger Taney, a student in the front row turned ashen-faced. I asked him what was wrong, and he said, dude. And I said, first off, it's Dr. Dude. <laughs> he said, dude, that guy looks just like my mother-in-law, which is a, 
a very bleak situation, which I will never forget. <laughs> Roger Taney was becoming concerned that Northerners and Southerners were fighting to the point of potential disunion over an issue that he felt was basically a fake issue. He, like the Northern Democrats, believed that slavery simply would never develop in the West, again because of climate and geography. The country was tearing itself apart. He felt like an issue for over an issue that was really illusory, that was a non-issue uh, uh, in, um, in reality. So Roger Taney decided to use his power as Chief Justice and use the Supreme Court to basically settle this dispute and answer this question, the question of slavery's legality in the Western territories. It is a tremendous miscalculation. It backfires tremendously. But again, his intent was to keep the country together, to get past these sectional divisions over slavery in the Western territories. The result of Taney's work is the notorious Dred Scott decision in 1857. The ruling in Dred Scott, which offends people today and offended Lincoln at the time, was when Roger Taney ruled that African Americans, whether they are slave or free, are not citizens of the United States. The notorious language was, they have no rights that a white person must respect. The ruling that's more important for us today is that Roger Taney ruled that Congress lacked the power and authority to ban slavery in American territories. That the free soil position calling for the banning of slavery in the territories was actually an unconstitutional uh, uh, position. Lincoln also panned this, critics also panned this as a pro-slavery move, but again, Roger Taney, at least in his heart of hearts, was trying to keep the country together. He was not intending to force slavery uh, into the West. The 1858 campaign was kick-started by a speech of Abraham Lincoln in Springfield, Illinois, which basically set the table for the entire debates. With the exception of the Gettysburg Address and Lincoln's second inaugural, it's probably the most famous and well-known speech of Lincoln's career. You've probably read the first paragraph of this speech at some point, especially uh, if you've had class with me. It's called the House Divided Speech. This was a metaphor that Lincoln used over and over again. This was just the most famous example. The beginning of the house divided speech is the part that everybody knows. Lincoln says, a house divided against itself cannot stand. And it goes on, I've forgotten, Michi oh. <laughs> True to form. A house divided against itself cannot stand. I believe this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. I do not expect the union to be dissolved. I do not expect the house to fall, but I do expect it will cease to be divided. It will become all one thing or all the other. Uh, the slavery question was dividing the United States. The country would collapse uh, if uh, it continued to be so divided. This is a strong introduction. Again, this is the part that everyone loves. If you want to retain the image of Honest Abe, this is where you should stop reading. The vast majority of the House Divided speech, 75% of the text, most of the speech, is actually dedicated to something quite different. Lincoln alleged that there was a, a, a conspiracy on the part of four prominent Democrats, Senator Stephen Douglas, ex-President Franklin Pierce, current President James Buchanan, and Chief Justice Roger Taney. Lincoln alleged that these four prominent men none of whom owned slaves, were engaged in a conspiracy to spread slavery, not just in the Western territories, but in the Northern states, in the free states. The charge, in essence, was they were trying to make slavery a national institution. As Lincoln said, we shall lie down pleasantly, dreaming that the people of Missouri are on the verge of making their state free, and we shall awake to the reality instead that the Supreme Court has made Illinois a slave state. This was an explosive, explosive charge. When Lincoln was laying out his case, he did the classic thing that all conspira uh, conspiracy theorists do. He did not provide evidence of a conspiracy. He simply pointed out to the coincidence of certain events. He said this, we cannot absolutely know that all these exact adaptations are the result of preconcert. But when we see a lot of framed timbers, different positions of which we know have been gotten by Stephen, Franklin, Roger, and James, and when we see these timbers joined together and see they exactly make the frame of a house, 
he had a thing about house metaphors, we find it impossible not to believe that they all understood each from the beginning and all worked on a common plan. Again, these four prominent Democrats, he says, have been working for years to spread slavery as a national institution. This was 1858. This was before the professionalization of journalism and academia. It could be that there was a different standard of evidence at the time, that politicians could say things without providing solid evidence. But that was not the case. And for eloquent testimony on this, we have Abraham Lincoln himself. Uh, he said this just a few days later in the Lincoln-Douglas debates in reaction to a charge that Douglas had made against him. When a man makes an affirmative charge, he must offer some proof to show the truth, truth of what he says, which is what he absolutely did not do in the House Divided speech. All right, historians are on the same page on this question. Was there a conspiracy? Absolutely not. There is no evidence whatsoever to suggest that those four Democrats were engaged in a pro-slavery conspiracy. And in fact, in the words of one scholar, it is tin hat lunacy to suggest that they were. Historians are divided on the question of whether or not Lincoln himself believed that this conspiracy theory was true. It is one thing to allege a conspiracy you believe in. It's another thing to allege a conspiracy even you know is false. I'm not sure which one is better. Um, uh, scholars are divided, but as Emily said, I was recently promoted to associate professor, so I'm going to throw my weight around a little bit. <laughs> it's my belief, at least my suspicion, that Lincoln knew that this conspiracy charge was false, that it was not true, in part because he's not a moron, but in part because of this. In 1858, there was this big public break and conflict between Senator Douglas and President Buchanan, again, co-conspirators, uh, according to Lincoln. Buchanan was actually encouraging Democrats in Illinois not to support Stephen Douglas. Lincoln knew about this, and we know Lincoln knew about this, because he was in contact with those pro-Buchanan Democrats in Illinois. And he was also encouraging them not to support Stephen Douglas. That would be a strange political tactic if you truly believe that these characters were involved in some kind of cabal uh, or conspiracy. For Stephen Douglas's part, he of course denied the conspiracy, which was probably quite earnest. And he made a conspiracy charge of his own against Lincoln. He alleged that Lincoln was secretly and covertly involved in an abolitionist conspiracy, not just to abolish slavery throughout the United States, but also to elevate African Americans to the level of social and legal equality. Douglas said this during the debates. He, speaking of Lincoln, is worthy of a medal from Fred Douglas for his abolitionism, Frederick Douglas, the famed abolitionist. He holds that the Negro was born as equal and yours, that he was endowed with equality by the Almighty, that no human law can deprive him. If you desire Negro citizenship, if you desire them, black people, to vote on an equality with yourself and to make them eligible to office, to serve on juries, and to adjudge your rights, then support Mr. Lincoln. And Douglas said repeatedly throughout the debates at all seven spots that he was the true candidate of white supremacy. Those quotes are quite odious. They littered the entire Lincoln-Douglas debates. All right, so for much of the debates, this was the content. This is what the two guys were fighting about, these make-believe, fake conspiracy theories. Lincoln was not an abolitionist. He was not calling for legal equality for African Americans. No Illinois politician of the time would have. It was too radical a position for that time and that place. Douglas also not, of course, involved in a pro-slavery conspiracy to spread slavery throughout the United States. They make these charges, yes, in long lyrical sentences that are beautiful to read, but it is complete bunk. Toward the end of the debates, to go back to the map, especially once you get to Galesburg, Quincy, and Alton, Lincoln especially started to rally. He started to drift away from the conspiracy theory charges and he started to talk in very dramatic terms about what he thought the debate was about, what the campaign of 1858 was about, and ultimately the real issues of American politics at the time. He said that basically we are deciding what kind of country we want to live in, what the future of the United States should be. 
Do we want a republic of slavery? Do we want a republic based on freedom? Which for Lincoln was just the current stage of a conflict that human beings had been fighting forever between oppression and freedom. He said this, this was Alton at the very end of the debates. The real issue is between one class that looks upon the institution of slavery as a wrong and of another class that does not look upon it as a wrong. That is the issue that will continue in this country when these poor tongues of Judge Douglas and myself shall be silent. It is the eternal struggle between these two principles, right and wrong, throughout the world. They are the two principles that have stood face to face from the beginning of time and will ever continue to struggle. The one is the common right of humanity, the other is the divine right of kings. The age old debate, are there some people who are born special and deserving of special privileges? Or are all people, by the nature of, be of being human, equal and worthy of natural rights. As far as who won the debate, you can look at the election results. Uh, the Republicans in 1858 received 244,252 votes. The Democrats received 211,124 votes. Now the state was malapportioned. The southern districts and the southern counties had more representation. Those were your Democratic counties and districts. And so despite receiving less votes, Stephen Douglas won the contest, won the race, and retained his seat in the Senate. But everyone agreed that Abraham Lincoln had been elevated to the level of a national star. Again, unexpectedly, these debates started to make national news, and Lincoln started to become a national figure. It was whispered about that he would be an excellent candidate for the nomination for the Republican Party in 1860. It's the Lincoln-Douglas debates. Uh, again, that catapults Lincoln uh, to stardom. But Lincoln was in no mood for celebration in 1858. He was dejected by this loss, as were his supporters. And as, as usually the case, the party came together to provide an autopsy, to explain why they were defeated. They really felt like they deserved to win the Senate seat in 1858. They came up with several theories. One of those theories, and I should say not a theory that Lincoln himself ever supported, but many of his supporters did, was this. That thousands of roving, robbing, bloated, pockmarked Catholic Irish were imported upon us from Philadelphia, St. Louis, and other cities. The allegation here is that immigrants were illegally brought into the state of Illinois to vote fraudulently in the election, to vote for Stephen Douglas. And so this fall, when you hear the debates, it will sometimes feel like the two candidates exist in these separate worlds where they have their own realities and they have their own truths. That will be just a long-standing American tradition. And another tradition is, if you lose a race, if you lose an election, rather than say you were defeated, just call it election fraud. <laughs> right. Thank you. Do vote this fall, though. Do vote this fall. <laughs> You're dismissed. Have a great day.